Hello? Oh, oh nice. lovely. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is a pleasure to be here and also to be you know, sharing the stage with this amazing group of speakers. My name is Ayomide Mimi Aborwa. I am the founder and creative director of Inri Travels and Lifestyle Media. We are the publisher of Inri Journal, which is an independent publication that focuses on Africa through culture and travel. And you know, we are really here today to really delve into this concept and idea of African Renaissance. You know, what does it mean? And then also, like I said, we are on this table, everyone's going to get the opportunity to, you know, introduce themselves. But we have publishers, journalists, editors, reporters from, you know, the continent and in the diaspora. And we're all just going to share our own perspectives and our, you know, what we've learned, the emerging trends that we've noticed when it comes to, you know, African journalism. I will be co-moderating with Wali Lawal, and I'm going to hand it over to him to introduce himself. Over to you. All right, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if I'm using the mic or this is my voice, but <laughs> yeah. look, I'm from Lagos and we actually don't need a mic uh, <laughs> to have a conversation. Um, but generally, my name is Wai Lawal. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of The Republic. Uh, the Republic is a digital media startup, and what we focus on is real-time news, information, editorial, and media coverage of African countries with a focus on Nigeria. Um, we run a flagship publication, um, also called The Republic. It's a quarterly magazine. And what we do with The Republic magazine is focus on long-form reporting about science, news, ideas, uh, politics, technology. You know, the lens is basically taking a look at the world um, from a Nigerian and broader African lens. We like to think of ourselves as a publication that's rooted in Nigeria, um, but that insists on its right to be um, universal. So in terms of how this is going to run, we will spend the first couple of minutes um, with intros, so I will hand over to um, my fellow panelists in a second. And the next thing we will do is um, try to keep this a bit interactive. So um, if any of us are coming from the um, panel we just had about you know, young people and the news, what's missing, as you can tell that there's quite a number of young people on this panel, so we will be doing things a bit different. And one of that is, or one of those things we'll be doing is basically just assume this table isn't there. Um, and we will try to keep this a two-way conversation as much as possible. Um, and so after that, we will then open the floor, um, have a Q&A, and hopefully we'll have enough time to really delve into um, you know, just the emerging trends that we're seeing in the African media space. We'll talk about the challenges, we'll talk about the opportunities, um, and then we'll talk about just looking ahead and what gets us excited about this space. So I'll hand over now to uh, my, panel, my fellow panelists, Anana Dakoasekiyama, to introduce herself. Um, I'm Nana Dakwa Zichema. You can call me Nana if you struggle to pronounce Nana Dakwa. I'm the author of a book called The Sex Lives of African Women. I also found myself in a position where I have inadvertently co-created a media house. Um, in 2009, my best friend and I started a blog called Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. It's a platform where we publish stories from African women around the continent and the diaspora about the experiences of sex, sexualities, and pleasure. We also have a podcast by the same name. Um, we offer writing fellowships, so it's a space for people to hone their writing, to have an outlet for their work. Um, and we also have a festival, um, which has so far happened four times in Ghana, um, also in Kenya, and depending on what the laws say, <laughs> We might have another festival this year in Kenya or not. So that's me in a nutshell. All right, thank you so much. And then over to you, Hannah. Hello, everybody. Or buona sera, as we say here in Italy. Um, my name is Hannah Ajala. I am a journalist, a presenter, currently the presenter of the most, well, one of the most listened to true crime podcasts out there. So check it out. Um, I have had the privilege of spending time in over 15. African countries, and I am also hopefully on mic. Now I am. <laughs> Should I rewind that? Um, hi, I'm Hannah. I'm a journalist and a presenter. Uh, I've travelled to over 15 African countries, and I'm also the founder of We Are Black Journos, which launched in 2018. And it's a way to uh, celebrate and connect black journalists in the UK who make up a small percentage of the overall population. Um, and I'm really happy to be here amongst this awesome panel and getting into the topics of conversation. Yeah. 
All right, thank you. And then Vanessa? Hi, everyone. My name is Adie Vanessa Ofyong. I am a journalist with CNN as Equals Team, which is the gender desk for CNN, um, where we report patriarchy and systemic issues affecting gender, which is an inclusive term. Um, before that, I worked in local media in Nigeria, Abuja, Daily Trust, where I reported on gender issues affecting women in local communities and what I call the periphery. Um, a range of issues from health, development, the arts, but how it all linked to women issues. And you know, that's what I've continued to do at CNN. All so right, thank you so much. And so that's our panel for this evening. Um, and before we move into sharing more details about our work, um, the next section looking at you know, the challenges, overviews, opportunities, and things like that. Um, you know, like I said, I want us to assume that this table isn't there and we're all kind of just having a conversation. And so I'm going to do something a bit controversial now. You know, we're looking at a continent that hasn't been properly represented in the media for a long time. We're looking at a continent that has this history that was kind of placed on it as the dark continent and has spent a lot of time over the years responding, writing back to the empire, taking control of its narrative, you know, to emerging to where it is at the moment. Um, for anyone that's in the room, of course, you know, this is a journalist, you know, it's a journalism conference. We can all remember the famous or iconic or uh, notorious Economist cover, um, Hopeless Continent. And then just shortly after that, we had Africa rising. But even these narratives amongst Africans have never really been accepted as narratives that we created for ourselves. And I think in this room, what we're really going to do is really talk about what it means to have a continent that is at this moment, you know, taking control of its own narrative. Um, we've always had our own narratives, but what the difference is now is we're paying more attention to those narratives, and we're going to talk about what the implications of paying that attention um, is, what are the you know, opportunities there, what are the challenges with that. But before we start, I wanted to throw a question to the audience, and I'll be doing this um, if you, you know, a couple of times. And I wanted to ask everyone in the room, do we feel like Africa's portrayal in the media is improving? Do we feel like it's you know, stagnant, it's still the same, or do we feel like it's worsening? So if we feel like it is improving, can we just see a show of hands? If we feel like the, the media's portrayal of Africa is improving, can we see a show of hands? Sorry, when you say the media, you mean the Western media? I, we just mean global media. Global media. Do we feel like it's improving? Do we feel like, you know, things are getting better? Do we feel like... <laughs> I'm not surrounded by optimists. The people who are I? saying it's improving are not feeling very confident. The hands are like this. Yeah. Okay. Say it with your chest. Up. All right. Okay. 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 So, okay. I love that. And I love you guys for like, you know, raising up your hands. So, you know, my sister over there, do you want to get up and tell us who you are and why you think it's improving? Hi, and I have a simple answer. The reason why I'm saying it's improving is because we have a panel like this and storytellers like you um, and telling stories that were so much of a taboo for so long, like talking about like just the stories of like African women and their sexuality. This was something we we'll never have had to like talk about like in even 10 years ago. This would have been completely, completely um unaccessible and i'm sitting here with like you know her and other women who are telling stories about you know what the con how the continent is evolving and stories of women and the youth awesome thank you so much and then we also got a response from here um can we get a mic to him as well so can you tell us who you are why do you think it's improving no, no, so we're still on improving. We're still on improving. We'll get to worse things. We'll get to worse things. Oh, man, how did I do this? Why did I do this? <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's a safe space. It's yeah, safe poorly, space. poorly. Yeah, I mean, um, no, I mean, God, even my name is the worst. Tom Rhodes. You can't get more colonial than that, you know? <laughs> eh. But uh, I, let me temper that a little bit. I want to say it's improved a little bit. Okay. And, and why I say that is because you're seeing a lot more African correspondents on the ground reporting their own stories, you know? Mm. Like a good friend of mine now is the, the Africa, East Africa correspondent for New York Times. And I was so happy when he got that job. We, we had a big party. And uh, these kind of, I mean, but I don't want to make it sound like it's great, you know? Don't, don't, you know. <laughs> no, but awesome. So we've had, 
it's improving because we're hearing some underreported stories. We're looking at you know voices that have previously gone unheard, and it's also improving slightly a little because we're seeing more people, we're seeing more visibility from local reporting, from local reporters who are then taking, you know, or at being at the forefront of those narratives. Does anyone in this room think that isn't true? Does anyone in this room think things aren't really improving, that we're just kind of maybe flatlined? It's just static, it's stagnant. Does anyone think that? It's just the same over the last maybe 10 years, 20 years. Nothing has really changed. Okay. All right, we have, we have, <laughs> no, no, we have someone, we have someone at the back, we have someone at the back over there. Can we get a mic? Can we get a mic to him? Yes, yeah. I, well, I don't know if I, have, I can articulate it fully, but <clears throat> I think as you have more Africans taking control over their voice and like challenging the narrative, you still have like other dynamics, like other structural or powerful dynamics that are like constantly and perpetually putting you know same narratives out there, or like reconfiguring the narratives and like transforming them to just perpetuate the same like you know, understandings and stereotypes that we have of uh, black folks. So, so I think a lot of times, I think when things are getting better, ultimately they're just breaking even. Sure. Mm. Sometimes. <laughs> All right. We also have a respondent from there as well. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think that, like the person who's just spoken, that if we are looking at the number of Africans um, involved in the mainstream media around the world, um, particularly actually somebody like someone said in Western media, um, there's a lot more sort of like hand-wringing in Western media about how they tell Africa, um, and so that these conversations that have been happening for the last decade um, uh, I think you would have to be a really bold newsroom in the US or in the UK or in, to not ask yourself, how are we telling Africa's stories? Mm -hmm. But I think that, that the answer then that has been to hire African people doesn't necessarily mean that we're prioritizing different types of narratives, mm -hmm. right? In the same way that having women doesn't mean that we're telling different types of stories about women. And mm -hmm. so the, the plethora of Africa stories might not be actually um, improving if we're just having Africa's tell the, if it bleeds the leads mm -hmm. narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final thing I would say is that um, if you then think about the question of Africa's media portrayal as Africa's proportion, Africa's contribution to that portrayal, maybe that hasn't actually gotten so much better. I'm, I'm wondering how many more African platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's remain, it's, it's, it's even keel, like someone said, because they're new things, mm -hmm. um, like all of you represent. Mm -hmm. um, but the things that have the scale continue to be Western-owned, mm -hmm. Western-led. The things mm -hmm. that have the influence um, and maybe that counter counteracts the, the good work you're doing. No, absolutely. And I think that those two points, I'm so sorry I forgot to ask you guys to introduce yourselves. But essentially what I'm understanding from those two points is, you know, we're seeing progress maybe on an individual basis individual countries, individual narratives, but structurally, infrastructurally, the things that actually last, the sustainability of these platforms, we're not really seeing that progress. So things kind of like balance out to no real change. Is anyone a bit more pessimistic than that? Is anyone thinking things are getting worse? No? No? Some pessimism is good. It gets us thinking. Does anyone think things have worsened? Maybe? All right, so we're all kind of skewed towards progress. Great, awesome. But what if I told you that Africa No Filter, which is an organization that funds um, you know, creative work, media, um, media on the continent, ran a survey, I think last year or the year before, and they looked at over 60 media outlets in 15 African countries. And what they found was 35% of, of the reports generated by these media outlets were basically from just copy-paste or mm -hmm. recycled or, or borrowed from the BBC, from the major Western global, um, you know, AFP, those types of institutions. What if I told you that, you know, 63% of the media companies surveyed, so these are media companies based on the continent, didn't actually have any foreign correspondents. So yes, they're telling their narratives, sure, but they're not really speaking to each other, right? So you have media companies in Nigeria talking about Nigerian stories, 33% um, of that is borrowed from the BBC, AFP, all of that. And then the rest of that is mostly local, concentrated in Nigeria, but you're not really seeing Nigerian journalists traveling to Ghana, traveling to Sierra Leone, traveling to South Africa to report on what's happening there. 
right? So that point that you guys made about the structural issues, it's a living, breathing point. And those are the things that can explain why statistics like that happen. Because of course, foreign press still dominates the media coverage of Africa. The coverage itself is improving. There's a lot more accountability. There's a lot more people responding, which is what I understand from this audience. But then we're not really seeing that kind of transformative, lasting change in terms of building systems, in terms of avoiding things like media capture, in terms of holding bad leaders to account, in terms of navigating things like media crackdowns, shutdowns, you know, oppressive governments, things like that. So it's a very, very complicated landscape. It's a very, 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 it's a deeply complicated landscape. It has so many challenges, but then, as you can see from this panel, so many things that kind of get us excited, so many opportunities. And those are the things that we're going to be discussing. So thank you guys so much for participating in the first question. What I really wanted to do, or what we really wanted to do, is really establish just how complicated this landscape is. It's not static, you know, in the sense that things have kind of changed in one way. Um, things have either gotten better, things are either worsening, but we can't actually just, you know, put a line and say, oh, you know, it's, it's not moving. Things are moving, both upwards and downwards, and we're going to look at what you know, those things are like um, from this panel. So to start with, what I really wanted to do is give my panelists the opportunity to tell you guys about their work and the ways in which their works reflect some of the challenges and opportunities that they've, you know, that they've experienced, either telling stories about the continent um, or telling stories that are Africa-focused or basically telling stories about the world to African audiences. And what I wanted to do was really take that title that we started with, which is the African Renaissance, right? We kind of had our own internal debates about that title. Is it real? Is it really happening? Um, and so I wanted to basically turn over to Nana in the first place. I think, Nana, you've done some really, really you know, interesting work when it comes to thinking about African stories, but when it comes to also thinking about African stories across multiple verticals in many iterations. You've been doing this for decades, so you've seen, you've had first-hand experience of how this landscape has changed over the years. Do you think like, things are getting better? Do you think it's improving? Is there a renaissance? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, we were chatting earlier, and I was saying I feel a bit of a discomfort with the phrase African renaissance, because it's, for me, assumes like, oh yeah, now we are cool. Whereas I think we've always been cool, right? <laughs> um, and the fact that maybe some of us get a bit more global mainstream media attention than we did years ago doesn't mean there is a renaissance. It just means maybe there's a bit more of a Western spotlight on, on what we do. And for me, that's not necessarily a renaissance. So that's the, the first thing I wanted to say. And I wanted to say, even if there is such a thing as a renaissance, it's because we've created our own platforms, mm -hmm. because we haven't felt like we've had access to all the platforms that exist out there in the world. And we've grown our own platforms such that people are now forced to pay attention to us, because they've realized that the content we create, the conversations we facilitate, is interesting to their audience. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started off by mentioning that in 2009 I started a blog with my friend, Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. It feels so passe now to describe yourself as a blogger, but I still think of myself as a blogger. And one of the things I realized over the past couple of years is I actually started a publishing platform because we're publishing content regularly, people keep coming back. We have an audience from across the world, from, you know, across the continent, as well as particularly countries like the UK, the US, Germany. Um, and yeah, I guess that's a form of journalism, even though that was never my intention. And then um, just because I love audio, last year we also started a podcast, Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. We've only produced one season, but we've been nominated for a Webby, and for me that was like really, really incredible. Um, and then what you were saying about, you know, for example, a lot of newsrooms not sending foreign correspondents to other places. The thing that we've been very intentional about is seeing ourselves as pan-African, because that's part of our politics, and deliberately working with Africans doing similar things in other countries. So our platform has done a lot of work with a, a platform called Hola Africa. They describe themselves as a pan-African womanist queer platform. Um, they're based in South Africa. The live festival that I mentioned that we organized um, last year, we did it with another platform in Kenya called The Spread. 
So for us, that collaboration has been really, really important, you know? Um, yeah, and, and it's been interesting and fun to explore. Of course, it's challenging because for the most part, the work has been self-funded. Um, and, you know, initially the content was very much, I guess, individually generated. Um, because the platform is about sex, sexualities, and pleasure, I was writing about my own personal intimate experiences. And what would inadvertently happen is people would DM me and say, and I had this experience, and I would say, well, do you want to write about it for the platform? And they will email it to me, and we'll publish it. Mm -hmm. But we're now in a position where we are having to reward people for their labor because we're recognizing that what they're doing is labor. And we also had people who were writing for us so regularly had their own audience. Um, we've been fortunate to attract one donor. We never applied for funding. They approached us. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you know when you're doing something that's a passion project, you want to keep it as a passion project, you recognize you need to compensate people for their labor, but at the same time, you don't want it to feel like a job. Sure. I feel like that's the situation I find myself in with adventures. You know? So we have our one donor, but we haven't really applied to anybody else for funding. But it's been fun. Um, we get good feedback from the people we're creating the community for. And I feel like that's the most rewarding, rewarding part. Awesome. So Vanessa, yeah. let me bring you into this conversation as well. And I think it's really great what you mentioned in that context that you were able to provide about starting this you know, as an individual, you know, as a blogger, and then over the years, just showing us the different ways in which it has progressed, it has expanded, and I think that that's really brilliant. Vanessa, you've had a very, a slightly different experience to that. You've also been in this industry for a very long time, but you've had the experience of working with um, newsrooms, um, so local, you know, news companies, but also um, international news companies. So right now, you've had your experience at Daily Trust, and then right now you're working at CNN. And I wanted to also get your perspective about what are some of the things that you feel have changed in the last you know, decade or so from your own experience? What are some of the things that you noticed about you know, changes at Daily Trust, maybe changes at CNN as well? How do you feel like this landscape is changing? And of course, like, you know, the general question that we've asked you know, at the beginning, um, is Africa's portrayal in the media improving the same or, um, or worsening? Um. <clears throat> So I'll go with my personal experiences. I stumbled on journalism, and when I started, um, I told the stories I felt strongly about, and they passed through my editors. But I told them with the goal to raise awareness about the issues, and in some cases to cause impact. Some I was successful at doing that. But in writing, and these were gender stories, but in writing for international media, these gender stories from local um, content, I'm finding that I'm having to do a bit more explaining of the issues that I'm writing about. So I'll give an example of um, a story I did last year on maternal mental health, where it was a series we did at As Equals, and we approached, my, I mean, my story took the angle of addressing and um, looking at women who already had mental health, health issues and then fell pregnant while mentally ill and what that experience was like. And I remember when we were editing the story, the senior editors were asking about the rights of the women in this facility where they were being um, taken care of and why the, the proprietor was the one who was deciding what they were going to do and their rights and all of that. For a Nigerian audience, we know that when you leave your parents and you live with an uncle or an aunt, that person decides for, I mean, for you what your life is about and what goes on in your life. It's a given that it's not about your rights but what they feel best for you. And it's not necessarily that those, those intentions of your, of your guardians at the time are negative. But in writing that story for, I mean, on CNN as a platform, I needed to put in all that explanations for the audience to understand. That's something that's different about the way I write now. Mm -hmm. When I was in local media, even when I was approached about um, stories by a foreign journalist, a lot of times they paid me what they thought I, I, was, I was due. I, ne I do not remember knowing what they... What, um, the total amount of money they received for the project. 
that, I, I mean, I tried to think about it this morning at an earlier session, and I do not remember ever being told the whole money that came in for that budget. I just got what I thought that um, foreign journalist, you know, gave me. But that changed for me as I grew in my profession. And I saw that I was um, attending conferences, I was relating with more um, Western journalists, and I began to build my confidence. I began to interact with a different um, set of people away from what I was used to. And my confidence was building. I was able to challenge you know, the things that Western journalists thought was befitting of me and what I thought I deserved. And in stories I was collaborating with them on, I could insist on what I, on how I thought the, the story should go, rather than what they had decided in their offices, um, what, rather than the approaches they had agreed on in their offices before they came to, to Nigeria. Sometimes I had to walk away from some projects that I thought would not be properly representative mm -hmm. of um, um, the narrat narratives that they were pursuing. But being with CNN, and another thing was, I think also being in a team where, where the, the members of the team have had these different experiences, it's, it's, it makes it a lot more comfortable and easy to discuss um, nuanced approaches mm -hmm. that the stories we're writing, I mean, from an African perspective, mm -hmm. should take. Mm -hmm. And the fact that um, I'm in Nigeria, I'm in Abuja, that's where I live, but I'm from Cross River, doesn't necessarily give me authority about a story I want to write about in, for instance, Lagos. Mm -hmm. I don't speak Yoruba. I know the culture as much as I see it on maybe TV or hearsay. Mm -hmm. I still need the help of somebody who is on ground, mm -hmm. regardless of um, what platform I'm writing that story mm -hmm. for. So there's also that um, home-based collaboration okay. towards story that I'm working on, you know, even for for CNN. So I'm going to jump off that, that idea of like home-based collaboration. I want to quickly bring in Mimi and Hannah. So one of the major things that happened or that we've kind of seen in the last couple of years is, I guess, the growing disconnect between when you look at, let's even start from just like local media landscapes, and that's like the growing disconnect between audiences, particularly increasingly younger audiences and authority figures. So from my own experience, you know, running a platform that is you know, described by many as political, what we get to see is younger audiences imagine authority figures as, you know, or they imagine leadership as acts of service, so you're kind of in leadership to serve, whereas older generations who oftentimes occupy positions of power, or rather positions of leadership, imagine leadership to be displays of power. And we saw this play out in NSARS as an example, right? So NSARS for us at the Republic was kind of where we got to, I guess, make our name in the sense that Traditional media companies had a kind of, you know, blackout initially. We're not really covering the protest. This was a protest that happened in 2020 um, in which young people were calling for an end to police brutality. And then in the beginning of, you know, this was happening all throughout lockdown, so you couldn't really have a lot of international coverage because, you know, people weren't able to move around or fly into Nigeria. But immediately, like, national TV lines or national radio kind of, you know, for the first couple of weeks of the protest, just wouldn't cover it. And so then you had digital media startups suddenly trying to figure out, connect with different protesters and all of these, you know, and all of these areas. And what we've seen since then is that rift has only continued to grow. Since NSARS, we've seen a Twitter ban, the first of its kind, in Nigeria, where you had you know, a social media blackout and things like that. And I wanted to kind of bring this you know, conversation to starting with Hannah. You know, Hannah, you, I think, covered part of the NSARS movement. And I wanted to kind of use this as an opportunity to also talk about maybe some of the opportunities that you saw with that as someone that was writing from the diaspora. I think actually you were around in that, in that situation, but in that, um, in that time, but you were working with organizations based in the diaspora to kind of tell this story um, in terms of what was happening. And I wanted you to kind of speak to, you know, either from that experience or just in general, how you're seeing, you know, where, for example, we're lacking in terms of that local infrastructure, how you're seeing models of collaboration emerge that are kind of telling these stories in the ways that they need to be told. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, one of my, 
most favorite sayings is media can't reflect society if society isn't reflected in the media. I mean, there's times when I have mixed opinions about, um, you know, certain editors or et cetera that are deployed in parts of the continent that aren't even from there, have no, you know, personal connections with it at all. And it just goes back to the fact that um, it's amazing and refreshing and relieving to see that there are Africans that are, you know, not taking a seat at the table, but we're owning the table. Like we're creating our own opportunities and our own media. And I think that comes with um, deliberative journalism. So as well as the field work that I've done, I also work a lot with the Media Diversity Institute who pay writers across the continent to share stories based on their own personal statistics and from just the things that they're, they're basically seeing. Um, I do understand the importance of bigger organisations. I mean, I mostly work with the British Broadcasting Corporation. We all know what that is. Um, and the importance of having uh, certain reporters and editors and et cetera that are based in different parts of the continent. But I'm also in support of local media and you know smaller platforms that are reachable everywhere mm -hmm. from TikTok, from Instagram and etc. And are therefore hopefully changing the face of um of what stories look like uh, in the continent. I mean, one thing I'm very thankful for is the travel content that I've seen um, of Africa because it's such a comparison if you're on Instagram and you know, you're know you seeing people telling stories as opposed to what the local news reports um, are seeing as well. And it's one of the, the main reasons why I decided to freelance. I was tired about reporting about Ebola and war and famine and corruption and all of that. And I'm like, okay, billions of people live there. I'm sure that they're not all doing that. Come on. Um, so, you know, being able to travel across the continent and work on these stories really opened up my eyes, which is shocking considering that I am from, you know, Nigeria, originally family and etc. but born and raised in the UK, but have a strong relationship with it. But when you're bombarded with these images, images, it has the power to shape that perception, which can be really dangerous. So very grateful for the work that I've done on the ground from NSARS to, you know, musicians and activists and dancers and you name it. I feel like Africa just has so much versatility, so much beauty and so many ways of storytelling, whether you've heard of that news organization or not. It's, it's great that I'm at a place where I can look at it from different lenses mm -hmm. as opposed to the typical, you know, Western media um, gaze, which is often rooted in supremacy, but yeah. So I wanted to bring in Mimi here, right? So one of the things that um, Hannah touched on was just this ability to travel and show different travel coverage. And I think for me, travel has always been this really political thing. So I only have a Nigerian passport and anyone who's traveled with a Nigerian passport knows what that's like. And I think for people, you know, one of the stats I started this conversation with was this idea that, you know, a lot of local publications or local media companies on the continent really struggle to find or to send people to other countries, you know, foreign correspondents. Obviously, thankfully, we have technology now. So you have companies that are able to, like, you know, work with local locals based in those countries. But when it comes to travel coverage or when it comes to even just traveling for work, you know, I wanted, us to, I wanted to kind of hear from you what the reality of that is like. And I think for me, you know, it's one thing to read, you know, publications that are, you know, going to these far flung places, writing beautiful stories, mm -hmm. but then to know that those stories don't really apply to you because your own experience would be very, very different. Yeah. So I wanted, I wondered if you could talk to us what it means to kind of produce travel coverage um, as someone with a Nigerian passport, as someone with, you know, a passport that isn't oftentimes recognized as, you know, so, uh, as a powerful instrument, you know, that can travel visa free. Sure. So, um, and how, sorry, and how, just sorry, <laughs> and how you've been able to navigate that process as well. Okay. So, um, one thing when I think of travel, I think of resources and I think of infrastructure. So, for example, if you want to visit a place, it's also linked to knowledge. What do you know of that place? You're not just going to say, okay, well, I'm going to go to Gabon today. If you don't really have a bit of context as to what's happening in Gabon, do I know anyone in Gabon? What's it like? And I find that in some particular localities, that information is not readily available. And then when you look at, I'll say, global publications that do focus on travel coverage, especially when it's focused on Africa, we have the more 
Morocco is the Egypt, South Africa, Kenya, which is linked to a safari, and then nothing more beyond that. And mm. that's what really, when people think of African travel, that's what, you know, it's the impression that, you know, translates. So for me, I'm passionate about travel. I do have a Nigerian passport, and applying for visas, it's, it's a challenge. You just have to find the hacks. You just have to, you know, keep trying. You have to build up, like, I met Hannah through Instagram because she also traveled. Like, oh, Hannah, do you have any contacts? How can I go to this place? What do you, you, you feel like you have to go the extra mile. Why do I have to go to the extra mile just because I want to visit a, a location? But unfortunately, that's just the reality for us. You know, so Iri was born out of the passion for travel and the desire to create a platform where, you know, this is... I went before Iri actually was founded. I remember that I used to reach out to other um, organizations like, oh, you should focus more on this, send a story on this, write a story on this. And the response is like, oh, yeah, sure. And you know, they're not really going to do it, but they're just responding to me. And it was a case of why am I waiting for other people to tell mm -hmm. our stories? Who better to tell the Nigerian story than myself, a Nigerian? And then also recognizing that there might be things that I do not know. So let's collaborate with you know, people, collaborate with you know, um, institutions, travelers, and really, really create our own path mm -hmm. and share that and disseminate that with the world. Mm -hmm. So it's been really fascinating just seeing how, you know, Irin has been received. We do focus on one um, African city per issue because Africa is typically conflated into one, you know, mm -hmm. Africa and it's, it's so many different countries. And travel coverage just means connecting with those on ground, embracing local talent, embracing local journalists, being real about what it is. We're not trying to glamorize it. It's like, oh, okay, we're so beautiful, we're the best in this and that. But we're saying that this is the truth. There is a lot of traffic, you know, there is, you know, there's, there's so much going on. Sometimes they take light, you just have to manage, deal with it. But then there's also a lot of beauty. And that beauty is what also connects us. It's that reality, it's that truth that gets us to connect with each other and build that understanding, whether it's, you know, intra-Africa or then also internationally as well. Mm -hmm. So that's just been the experience for me. All right, awesome. So I wanted to quickly pause here in case we have any questions from the audience. We have time for about two questions. Um, so I'm going to pause here just in case we have any questions. Any questions? All right, awesome, because I have a question, right? <laughs> so I think the question for me that I have for the panel is, you know, so you guys have shared some really brilliant perspectives as to your different platforms and the challenges that you face, the opportunities for collaboration, mm -hmm. the opportunities for storytelling that have, you know, that have emerged. And my question for you is, as you think about you know, our engagement with the media space as disruption, what are the things that get you excited? And of course, you know, we only have about you know, a couple of minutes, so I wanted to just quickly hear from you guys. You know, what are the, the trends that you're seeing? What are the patterns that you're seeing um, that get you excited about you know, Africa-focused media? I'll go. I'll just say it's the emergence of these various platforms. You know, the Republic, you know, Erie Journal, not also toot our own horns, but there are also many other publications that are emerging that are focusing on various niche content. And they're really like what you said, Nana, they're actually just spotlighting them themselves. We're not waiting for other people to notice us. We exist. We're doing this because, you know, we enjoy this. There's value in what we're saying and what we're contributing to the conversation. And it's just really refreshing to see people just taking that ownership of their mm -hmm. voice. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's exciting. Awesome. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I'm particularly excited about audio content, you know. Um, I feel like podcasting is still a fairly new platform, and you can take it anywhere. And especially for the African continent, I think it's still relevant because people still listen to, like, FM radio, right? Um, of course, there's the question of access and data. But that's something I'm really excited about, as well as the opportunities for Pan-African collaboration. That's always been super, super important to me. Um, yeah, that's what gets me excited. Awesome. Vanessa, did you want to go? Um, for me, I think is the way um, social media has also helped with the portrayal of Africa and how it is, like with Nigeria and our recent elections, how it's become a tool for fact-checking or fact-checking international media. And I'll give an example. Last week or maybe two weeks ago, when the Times published um, the... 100 most influential people and mentioned the president-elect and how Nigerians, you know, were debunking some of the 
assertions that they had made along with evidence. So for me, that's something that's exciting, you know, and um, away from don't sit where you are and write what you think about us. Whether you agree with, with the um, response to the Times report is another kettle of fish, but the fact that they have a platform where they could challenge something that they were very familiar about that international media had put out there mm -hmm. is something that I am pleased about. Mm -hmm. Hannah? I would say that it's just incredible how much we're shaping our own narratives. Um, and I'm so thankful for social media because it's honestly connected me with incredible journalists across the continent, um, from Madagascar to Mauritania to Somaliland. And that really opens up my eyes to the opportunities that are there, the ways of storytelling, and the fact that we don't need the West for any of um, you know, the progression of the stories that we tell, how we tell them, on what magnitude, on where it's shown. So I'm really excited to see how far it can go. Mm -hmm. I think we all had a chat, and I remember reading this quote from a UN expert or something saying that the continent is about two decades behind. But if anything, I just see it as you know a really unique, buzzing place with thousands of languages, customs, beliefs, and traditions that has influence across the globe. So I'm really excited to see you know, more of the exciting things that come out of that. Awesome. Yeah. And I think for me, um, I'm particularly excited um, about two major things. I think we've talked about several things here. We've talked about it from an editorial lens. We've talked about it from an infrastructural lens. And I think on the editorial lens, I'm really excited about the types of stories that we're telling. Um, they're becoming a lot more specific. They're becoming a lot more um, intra-regional. So these days, it's not rare to find audiences in Kenya who are interested in what, you know, Ghanaians think about Kenya. It's not rare to find, you know, South Africans who are interested in what Nigerians think about Amapiano. And why that is so important is that you have a country, I mean, rather you have a continent of 54 countries suddenly interested in other 54 countries. Like the opportunities for storytelling is just infinite. Like the amount of ideas that are coming forth and the amount of interest that we're seeing, the verticals, the lines, the editorial, you know, directions that we're seeing are really just like not at a scale that we just haven't seen before. I think one of the things that you know, anyone who operates on the continent often knows is, you know, it's not that in many, you know, in many occasions, it's not really that you know, Western or global publications have necessarily a negative agenda, but there's always this idea that there's only so far a global publication can do to cover a publication that isn't necessarily where their core audiences are based. And right, so for a lot of Africans, for a lot of African people owning media, for African people working in the media, they've kind of seen those gaps as an urgent need for them to fill in those vacuums, as an urgent need for them to tell stories that don't necessarily have to you know, rely on audiences based abroad, but actually the interests of the people that those topics are immediately affecting. You know, when it comes to things like, you know, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, for example, we saw within the first couple of weeks how the global narratives around the invasion were all about how borders were opening up to Ukrainian refugees until, you know, people back home, people on the continent were starting to say, but I have relatives. You know, we have about 15,000 Nigerians who were studying in Ukraine. And suddenly people were like, well, my siblings have not been able to cross through the borders. And suddenly we're putting pressure on a lot of local media companies and a lot of local media organizations and international media organizations to kind of pay a lot more attention to that lens. And then suddenly we're seeing images, videos of people being stopped at borders. And I think that for us complicates the world that we live in. But it also really shows that there's so many different stories that are emerging that previously we may not have you know, been able to pay attention to. I think on the infrastructural side of things, I'm really, really interested about or really excited about the different business models that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of mission-oriented platforms emerging. And why mission-oriented platforms are really important is because a lot of media companies, like the Republic, for example, you know, are finding that you can't rely on things, you can't necessarily solely rely on things like advertising to grow. Because in the local media markets, we're often saying that the biggest ad buyers are the government. What do you do when your you know, entire business is 
you know, position to negate the government or to hold the government accountable. That means reaching out to your readers and getting them to actually pay for the types of content that they want to see. But we're actually seeing that readers are increasingly interested in paying. The Republic is a subscriptions-based platform, for example. We're also seeing different other types of models, you know, um, emerge in the sense that there's a lot of decentralization going on. So one of the things that um, Mimi was able to speak about was how you have a lot of people who are running platforms in Nigeria, but telling stories in you know, Ethiopia, for example, or in other countries based on, you know, leveraging technology, being able to work virtually, being able to spread their editorial rooms. You know, you can have editors based in Kenya, you can have editors based in, you know, um, South Africa, you can have editors based in Eswatini, all under the same organization because we do have those, you know, the technological infrastructure to support that. We're seeing a huge rise of things like FinTech, which is making it easier to pay people to send advances. Um, and those types of things, I think, are getting me excited about where, you know, the, the industry is headed. Um, I don't know if there's any additional thing that you wanted to, to add. Oh, there's a question. Oh, okay. We have only about five minutes. So <laughs> Hi there, this has been an incredible panel, one I was, have been excited about for a very long while. I'm Candace Fortman, I'm from an organization called Outlier Media in Detroit, in the United States, and it's a nonprofit newsroom, very mission aligned. So I'm, the, everything that has been said here um, really resonates. But I ask this question with a lot of care. Um, how might those of us, unfortunately in the West for some of us, um, better cross-learn, cross-support um, the efforts that you all are doing. And in the same way, there are many of us starting newsrooms for the very same reasons you are starting newsrooms, because we saw our communities misrepresented in the New York Times and in other publications. Um, what is the cross-learning that we can do, and how can we better connect to one another um, to share stories, to share business models, and the like? I would say, I would say literally connect. I do believe so many magical things happen in an inbox, DM, literally connect, more than happy to. I do believe you want to go quickly, go alone. You want to go further, go together. So please, let's have a chat after. We'd, more, we'd be more than happy to connect. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, whenever I speak about pan, the importance of Pan-African collaboration, it includes the diaspora, yeah. you know, it recognizes the fact that there are people in the diaspora because of colonization, because of slavery, because of migration. And so for me, that's really, really important um, because our worlds are connected. You know? So a few years ago in Ghana, we started a, the, the government started a year of return campaign, which was really targeted at, I feel like, primarily African Americans. We saw a lot of celebrities come to the country and you know, take lovely pictures, which is all great. At the same time, we were dealing with a situation where um, there was a huge surge in homophobia, but that wasn't being reported about, right? And, and for me, that was a story I wanted to tell to the diaspora, to say that when you come to Ghana and you have a good time, and you are actually hanging out with our president and chilling because he parties with these celebrities, I also want you to raise the social issues that are important to us. And so I pitched an op-ed to Essence because in that case, my target was the African-American audience. And I think we can do those kind of collaborations. Um, yeah. And I've heard of Allied Media. I've heard only great things about Allied Media. All right, awesome. I think you had a question, so yeah. we can take that as the final one. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, all that you guys have shared today is just amazing. I'm very inspired. So I'm a local journalist and a student, postgrad student here in Italy. And I was just wondering uh, what, if you guys have a piece of advice that you want to give to uh, you know, all the journalists who have never been to Africa but still are writing stories about African countries, would that piece of advice be and why? And, uh, and also my second question about uh, a younger audience, like do you see any improvement? Do you have hope for younger generations? And why do you have hope if you do have hope? Thank you. I just wanted to touch on the first question. Um, great question. And honestly, I feel like post pandemic, social media has made it so easy just to talk to strangers on the internet. I've had students in Russia say, oh, I've never been to Nigeria. I don't know anything about it. Do you mind sharing X, Y, and Z about it? There are countless um, amazing journalists across the continent who will be more than happy to talk to you about whatever you're researching. 
I mean, and you can throw these questions on social media. Mm -hmm. Juno request is a popular hashtag that we use. So just throw your question and you're sure to get an answer. But then I think that's what this kind of platform, IGF, is about. So, I mean, continue relationships beyond um, the, the sessions that we're having. She had and a I second think the question, question about um, yeah. hope, but I think, we're, I think we're, oh, we're, okay. we're on time. Oh, okay. We've got to go up and down. <laughs> So I will just quickly summarize and wrap up um, and hopefully answer your question at the same time. I think this has been a fantastic panel. We've seen that things are very complicated, dynamic, changing. There's lots of reasons to be hopeful, and in particular, lots of reasons to be hopeful for a younger generation because we're looking at audiences who are gravitating away from established models and looking for decentralization. They want you know, to get their news from TikTok. They want to get their news from Instagram. They want to get their news from regular people living their regular lives. And I think that, for me, kind of exposes those audiences to a lot more authenticity and a lot more specificity than maybe other generations haven't been exposed to. There are risks in terms of misinformation, in terms of expertise, but I do think one reason to be hopeful is we are seeing a lot more specificity in that people know more about Lagos and will know that this is restricted to Lagos and not necessarily Nigeria or even worse, Accra or anywhere else on the continent. So I'm really like hopeful about this younger generation because it's a more specific generation and it's a generation that is you know, very much about authenticity as well. And so they're looking beyond, okay, what might I see in this big global platform? Where can I find like, you know, the actual people living these lives and how do I listen to them? And I think the platforms do exist for that. So that's why I'm really hopeful. All right, thank you guys so much. And I'm hoping that we're able to answer your question.